Thank you, Peter. So this talk will be about combining reinforcement learning and constraint programming for combinatorial optimization. It's joint work with my colleague Quentin Capard from Polytechnique, André Siri from the University of Toronto, as well as Thierry Moisin and Isabeau Primo Schwartz, which were at Element AI that was recently acquired by ServiceNow. So before I start, I want again thanks all the thank all the organizers and, and everybody in, in IPAM for this fabulous conference and incredible lineup and, 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 and talks that I've seen so far. I've not had much so fun in a conference for a long time. So it's it's incredible. All right, so let's start. Um, we know solving combinatorial optimization problem is difficult. We have to pick one optimal solution out of a set of discrete solution, which are the set might not even, even be connected and it's not continuous. Um, but we have to do it uh, often because these are important problem in transportation, both ground and air transportation, in leisure, in supply chain, in retail, in healthcare. And most importantly, um, we have to do it very often. Now, um, if a human would be planning uh, and solving commercial optimization in, this, in these settings, they would, when they would start, they would be quite bad at it, and then it would improve over time. After a few months, they become reasonable, and after a few years, they become expert. And this is not the case for our algorithm, and this is why we'll try to, to see if it, we can exploit the fact that we need to some, solve these problems over and over again in order to become more efficient. Now, solvers we use to solve combinatorial problems that arise in logistics problems, either in healthcare or supply chain, are typical integer programming or constraint programming or SAT solvers, and they rely on some form of branching uh, or solution space exploration that is a complete uh, method heuristics as we exist as well, but I'll focus on, on complete method for this talk. Now, this is nice because they provide guarantees of optimality, which means that even if they are not able to, to find the optimal solution, they can provide some kind of dual bound that tells us how far we are from, let's say, a potentially optimal solution. And we also have also a, a good set of general purpose solvers for each of them. Some of them are commercial and or some of them are open source and free. Now, the downside is, of course, this is a complete exploration, so it takes time. But most importantly, even though um, you solve this problem day after day after day, the solver doesn't improve over time as a human would do, right? You're not, we're not leveraging the fact that we are solving these problems. So I think this is what a lot of people are trying to do in this workshop, trying to see if uh, we can learn something from numerous solution, resolution of the same problem and try to be uh, more efficient uh, at it. So how can we do? We've seen a couple of different approaches throughout this, uh, this very nice workshop. One of them, uh, as laid out in the paper by um, uh, Joshua, Andrea, and, and Antoine, is that you can try an end-to-end -end approach. And we've seen a couple of them this week as well, where you typically just model the problem with some machine learning approach, uh, one of the novel architecture that exists, and then you can output a solution directly for that problem. Now, this is, this is a extremely fast, so it, it's um, um, it's very efficient at solution time. It does take a little bit of time to train depending on the on the architecture and the type of problem, but once it's trained, it, it's quite easy to use. The downfall is that you have no um, guarantee of optimality, so basically just behave as a heuristic. Um, and it's not always if, uh, easy or straightforward to model a problem. I mean, techniques are really improving fast, but when you see a new problem, you basically have to go back to the drawing board and handling constraints are uh, can be difficult. So we've seen, uh, again, a lot of progress this year and the preview in a way to handle combinatorial constraints in these things, but um, in real uh, industrial problem, as Bistra has mentioned them, we have a lot of them and that's uh, that's an issue. Um, so in the same paper, they, the authors uh, propose some integrated method and, and how to integrate operations research and machine learning in a way that they collaborate. And the idea being that you know, basic OR techniques such as MIP or search algorithm can control the, the, the solution um, exploration and guarantees of optimality. And we can leverage machine learning to um, speed up that process by guiding uh, branching decisions um, or adjusting the parameters of the solutions are more robust. And, and a, lot of, a lot of effort has been done in, in the last year. Um, and before, I think I've just put a few papers here, but compared to the very exhaustive list that Maxim Gas put up yesterday when uh, in his talk about Ecole, I think this is just a few of these important papers, and some of them are coming out even uh, in last month, um, that are explaining how you can adjust um, exact methods such as integer programming and, and other technique to um, be more efficient and behave um, better. Now, in the 
<laughs> the difficulty here is that we need or you need to either um, have a lot of label data, which means solving a lot of these commercial problems and myths, and that takes time, uh, and you need to have those, or it means that you need to, during search, solve again myths and, and problem, and that is can be quite time consuming and difficult to get in the, uh, in some realistic situation. So what we would like to do, and, and our focus on, on that line of work is trying to still maintain the ability to prove optimality or at least compute bounds, uh, but see if we can go, um, uh, let's say on a broader class of problems and integer programs. And that's why we're going to focus on constraint programming um, because it allows to model a vast category of problems which are uh, linear, not linear, that incorporate predictions from machine learning or all sorts of things, and also uh, um, have another benefit that I'll mention a bit later down the road. We'll um, try to learn from previous decisions, and we'll also try to restrict ourselves where, in cases where we can do unsupervised learning, or basically we don't we don't need to solve the the, the problems beforehand. So that's why we'll focus on uh, using techniques from reinforcement learning or deep uh, reinforcement learning. And what we will do actually is leverage the fact that uh, dynamic programs can provide a unifying representation between constraint programming and reinforcement learning, so that we can build a framework that is um, more generic and that would do a lot of the of what needs to be done in an automatic uh, manner. So let's start with a bit of notation. If I have a dynamic program where I want to optimize a function f over the set x, which is defined by uh, integer numbers, in, in dynamic program, I would really start by having a set of decisions or actions or controls uh, that take their value in a domain. And um, I will define a set of transitions that bring me from one state at a given stage to the next state. And uh, giving those, I have a, a decision problem that is set in, in a set of stages. So this is perfectly well suited for optimization problem where you actually need to take a series of decisions in sequence. Not all problems are stated like that. Many of them can be reformulated like this, but of course, not all problems can be reformulated like this. But when we think about logistics problems, uh, you can think of, a, let's say, a routing problem as a problem that you have to solve like in a single thing. But in reality, when you think about own care or... Um, or even scheduling. Sometimes you have to take decision patient by patient, or some of these or some of these problems decompose in a set of, of successful, successive decisions that you have to take. Each time you take a decision, you'll get a reward. And uh, we have a set of validity, which are basically constraints that says what you can or cannot do, and dominance rules that will take out transitions that lead to suboptimal part of the solution space. Now, once you have that, you can uh, now solve the, the Bellman equation that we've seen many times this week, and that gives you the optimal solution, but we all know that this blows up for any realistic size uh, problems, even if we can filter out uh, some of the possible transitions. Now, moving from dynamic programming to constraint programming, and constraint programming, what do we have? We state a problem again with variables, which take their values in domains that are subject to constraints, and we have an objective function. So we can make a parallel between the two. We can say we, that we could model a DP using a constraint program if we have two sets of variables. One set of variable that will basically define the state of the solution at a given stage, and one set of variables that actually describe the actions. So we can use this auxiliary variables to kind of define a state in an implicit manner. So we don't actually need to enumerate extensively all the states. They can be captured by a set of CP uh, variables. Now, once we have that, we can write down a, a CP model uh, where actually the XI S variable here are the states, so they can be defined as the initial state. And then we can define a set of validity condition or dominance on uh, the fact that I can take a certain uh, action at a given state. Now, these can be sometimes straightforward, sometimes a little bit more complex to define. But in constraint programming, you can always program your own constraints and add them to the solver. But more importantly, we have um, basically um, native constructs, which are called the element or the table constraints that allow us to define relationships, automatons, or any kind of, of tabular uh, relations between things. So we can state the transition table and the reward function um, in a straightforward way and a native way in CP. So that's quite useful. So that being said, I can uh, lay out the framework we're proposing here. So I'll start from the center. So for any combinatorial optimization problem, we first need to uh, define a dynamic programming model for this. So this is the assumption of this old talk that there exists a dynamic programming model for the problem we want to solve. 
Now, when this is done, um, we can leverage the fact that we're using DP to build uh, quasi automatically a reinforcement learning uh, environment. And I'll say a few words about that when we'll give an example a bit later on. So once this environment is set up, we can just call any you know, default of the shelf agents that will optimize that, given that we can generate instances of the problems that we want to solve. So if it's a, you know, a toy problem or a criminal problem that has a generator, we can use that. If it's an industrial problem, we need to have a simulator or some form of solution builder that, or sorry, a problem builder that will create similar instances than ones we have seen uh, in industry. So there are some simulator that can be built to do that. that that's doable. So once we have an agent, we'll have something which is a value selection heuristic, and I'll come back to that later. On the other side, I can start from my dynamic programming model and then also automatically build a constraint programming model that captures it. And by having the states represented implicitly, I, don't, I, I take care of the fact that this thing blows up. Now I have an implicit representation of the DP. Now, because it's implicit, now I have to search over the state space rather than just you know, having a Bellman equation over it. And this search will be using one of the you know, standard search that we have in, in CP solver. But instead of using some greedy metric that comes from the problem definition, I will, I will use some of the learned value selection heuristic that comes from my uh, ML agent. Once this is done, now I can have a solution to my problem and, and I'm done. So it's kind of a mix of combining both reinforcement learning and, and CP using the same universal bank programming language and building on top of uh, clever search heuristics and CP and then clever design uh, reinforcement agent uh, that exists. Uh, so in this implementation, we did the, the learning in, in PyTorch and uh, Python and the CP model in uh, G code and C++. So there was a bit of a hassle to go back and forth and there were some performance issue with this. So I'll say a few words about that when I finish the talk. Um, a few words again about the architecture. Um, so the deep learning architecture we need to use, and this has been mentioned a lot uh, in this uh, workshop, needs to handle um, commercial problems that have different size and needs to be invariant with respect to, to input permutation. So with, in this project, we've experimented with two of those. So graph attention network uh, was proposed by, by Peter uh, three years ago, and then the set transformers also that came uh, a year and a half ago at SCML. So these, these provide embedding that we can use in a feed forward network. With respect to reinforcement learning, we played with two types of agent, DQN, that provides us one value uh, for each uh, action or for each possible action. So sorting this value, we can have a ranking of all possible action. They provide some expected reward of the value of that uh, of, of the action. And uh, policy gradient, which will also basically give us rather probability that we should choose any of these action. And then we can sample this probability to search for a solution. So how now can we embed those in constraint programming? So well, um, one thing we can do is merge them with um, classic technique. And I won't have time to really go into detail of these, but the pseudocodes are all in the paper, which actually appeared in uh, AAAI this year. Um, the first one is using branch and bound. So just a classic branch and bound, but we're going to try to branch on the, the, um, the value that has the highest value of, uh, uh, has Q value. So we're basically just sorting the branches according to the, uh, the ranking that we get from, from DQN. Second possibility is, is a technique that comes from constraint programming that's basically a form of limit discrepancy search, which the idea is basically once you sort all the values according to, to your, your, your Q values, now if you would branch only on the first one, this would be a discrepancy of zero. If you branch on the second ranked value, that's a discrepancy of one. If you branch on a third one, that's a discrepancy of two. So you can say, okay, I'm going to traverse my search tree by only considering a solution with discrepancy value zero. And then maybe, okay, now we'll consider discrepancy value between zero and five, and then five and 10. And so forth, you, you allow more and more branching to the right, uh, but in a kind of way that's global in the search tree. And finally, we have restart based uh, search, which will basically just sample out the, uh, the probability uh, that we get out of PPO or the policy gradient until they reach a solution and then just restart like this, uh, allowing more and more uh, uh, width within the probability distribution. So at first you sample only the, the most promising value and then you enlarge the sample as you go down the search, uh, search. So let's illustrate this on a, on a classic problem just to start. 
Um, the TSP, we've talked about it a lot. There was an incredibly good talk by Xavier earlier that explained basically all the techniques that were proposed for this method, but I'm going to be very, very basic here just to illustrate how this is done. We start where, let's say, a mill that produces um, material that we need to deliver to a few customer. And the states is uh, defined as the last customer visited plus the customer that we still need to visit. An action is to go visit a given customer subject to some validity condition. Transition is just updating the state. And the reward will be the travel distance. So this is plain vanilla uh, DP. And um, it is straight as follows. It's, I start with zero. I have still go to, uh, to one, two, three, and four. Let's say as a first action, I decide to go to four. Now, if I do that, the cost will be basically the distance going from zero to four. And the next state will be to four. And now I have to go to one, two, and three. Okay, so that's, that's quite straightforward. Interesting thing uh, here is that I can, again, leverage the, the, um, the similarities between dynamic programming uh, formulation of this problem and the RL environment and to define my state. Now, the, different, the difference now is that if I would solve this problem with DP, I would completely forget uh, the fact that it's maybe the thousandth time that I'm solving this TSP. Well, because I'm doing RL, I'm going to give in the state information about that given instance, the coordinate of the nodes, whatever information, the quantity demand, or anything that I have which is relevant and for which I have a dis probability distribution, I will give to the RL, RL environment so that I can recognize uh, and learn that, that it's seen these types of, of problem and instances before in the past. Uh, Customers' uh, actions are the same, transitions are the same. And then as a reward, I need also to make sure that I drive the solutions towards feasible solution. Right? Normally in TSP, it's not a big issue because everything is feasible, but if we add more and more constraint, and especially if in the constraint programming model, I have some constraints that are not embedded in the DP environment, I will need to drive the DP towards finding feasible solution and thus giving a good reward every time I have a primal solution that is identified. So, uh, just illustrate the branch and bound uh, process rapidly so we, we understand what's going on. And also I can uh, I'll, uh, illustrate some key aspect of the method. So I start from this point. I ask my RL agent, what should I do? Um, once it's trained, it says you should go to customer number three. So this is what I do. Once I go there, now I have to choose between one, two, and four. I ask again, let's say the uh, for the Q values and say also the best Q value what I have is for visiting customer number two. So this is what I do. Once I go there, I ask again. Then this time, I, it seems I should go to four. So I do that. And once I'm done, uh, I go to one because the only possibilities and I go back. So this is what you would do typically if you were solving this problem with uh, uh, an epsilon greedy algorithm that would just follow the Q values until you find a, a solution. Now I want a complete solution. So this is just feasible one. I need to be thorough. So I will just backtrack, erase that option, work back up, erase that action, work back up. Now, once I'm there, I have, I have a choice, right? I'm going to either I can ask again to my RL agent, give me, like go back and recompute the values from scratch and give me the new Q values, knowing that I can't actually go to four. So the results would be different. Or I can just keep the results I had last time I was there and cache them and then reuse them. Um, no, assuming that they're not up to date, but they're probably still uh, reliable. And so once I have there, I know that I can go to one and then I can finish uh, the tour there. So these are two possibilities and we're going to test both. So the TSP has been quite studied, well done. It's, it's, uh, it's easy to solve, uh, relatively easy to solve from a deep learning uh, um, perspective and reinforcement learning perspective because everything is feasible. So let's try to make this a little bit more difficult and add constraints and tough combinatorial constraints such as time windows. Now, the difficulty here is that if I have very tight time windows like this, right, saying at which time I need to visit customers, it might happen that the solution actually, let's say it needs to go to one, to two, to four, and then to three will be quite ugly, right? This is, yeah, there's a lot of arcs which are crossing, there's a lot of wasted traveling and so forth, but I might not have an option, right? If this is an home care setting, then there's some people I need to take out of bed, some people I have to give dinner to. There are some strict hours that are re related to those uh, services, and I cannot, right, for in the hope of saving a few miles, there's no she shuffle and, and take somebody out of bed uh, like at 2 p.m. So I need to meet these uh, these requirements. Um, okay, 
So we'll, we'll stick to the plan. We'll just keep um, our DP model. We'll just increase the size of the state a little bit. We'll add um, the time at which uh, uh, the customer has been visited. So this one we already had, last not visited. We'll add time T at which a customer is visited, uh, the set of things that still can be done. And the problem data here is a bit more rich. We have lower bounds and upper bounds on time windows, as well as the distance matrix so that we had for the TSP. Now I can write the full DP model using this. It's pretty straightforward, except here you have the subtleties that in TSP with time windows, you are allowed to allow to arrive early, um, but you, if you do so, you have to wait. Um, in the literature, you don't pay for waiting. In practice, you always pay for waiting. Like whoever's waiting, you have to compensate. So here I'm solving, um, um, let's say, uh, academic problems, so I won't put a cost, but in practice I could. Um, Validity, so you can only go to a customer that you can still visit. If you can't go to a customer where you would arrive too late, and this is the is a nice trick here. It, it says that if you if you there's a customer at which point you would arrive too late, you must delete him from the set of remaining customer. And and this is why it's way better to track the remaining customer than the previous customer because of time windows things might become comparable and then you could use this dominance uh, criteria here and saying that no, these, these sets of, of remain customers are equal. Therefore, any two paths that, that lead to them, I could only keep the short term. Okay, so that's the TSP model. Let's have a look at the results. We tested a few different things. Um, constraint programming. So we took the OR tool library. That's the one from Google. It's pretty good at solving routing problems out of the box. Uh, we took a vanilla CP model implemented in G-code using the global constraint circuit and, and scheduling that come in G-code and that allow to model this with five lines, basically. And then we use here, is, it's a CP model, the same model as here, except we use an iterative discrepancy search, but the ranking, instead of giving being given by uh, our L agent, the ranking is just the you know, shortest edge out of, of the node. So it's, it's the same approach that we're going to test against uh, machine learning, but we use the uh, a greedy random, uh, sorry, a greedy algorithm. Okay, uh, this is our pure end-to-end no learning methods. So DQN is just uh, no epsilon greedy. We just follow the best node and hope for the best. So unfortunately, because um, there's a lot of feasibility issue, we often don't find any solution at all. And this one is just a beam search with the width of 24 using the probability distribution uh, we obtained it by the policy graded. Finally, we have our three uh, hybrid algorithms, one without caching. So they should have a more accurate uh, um, estimates and one with caching that no, it is less accurate, but much faster. So we can see a few things. First of all, um, these problems are hard. We, we put tight time windows, so just out of the box CP or even out of the box uh, Google's solution, just don't even find feasible solutions for them. Um, CP nearest, like the, sam the sampling mechanism works for size 50, but doesn't work for size 100. Interestingly enough, um, PPO is still able to find feasible solution. Of course, it's not proving optimality, like none of these two can never prove optimality because they're not complete approaches, but they can find uh, feasible solutions to this size and, and a little bit to this size. And here we see two things. So first of all, on size 50, both method with and without caching are doing well, although this one is, is a bit faster. But we see here that, that without caching, we start to have a problem proving optimality and, and execution times are longer. Um, and I'll come back to that later. Um, Interestingly enough, also, I think uh, PPO is more uh, is performing well here without any branching. But when we start to look at hybrids, actually DQN methods are doing uh, better than PPO. So it seems that they actually the, the RL agent that you use uh, on a standalone or versus in a, within a branching algorithm isn't, uh, isn't the same one uh, which dominates. And so, finally, uh, that's the challenge for everybody uh, working on the Topic in about two minutes left. Two. Okay. Good. Uh, so um, the time it takes to to make a prediction is quite crucial, right? If if I'm just uh, if I'm calling the agent at every single time, I need 34 milliseconds. If I'm caching, I can reduce that by two orders of magnitude to 16 milliseconds. But it's still two orders of magnitude slower than just you not know, looking at my data and making a, a greedy choice here. So in this context, it still pays off. But in some other context, it, it's a challenge.
So I won't have much time, but we also studied a nonlinear problem. So it's a form of, of complex nonlinear knapsack where you, um, an investor looks at, at um, um, picking up a good investment and um, um, they, they rely on the four moment of the, uh, the investment distribution. So typically uh, it's a form of knapsack, but the reward you're, that you're trying to look at uh, investment that have a lot, uh, like a very high expected return and skewness, but very low standard deviation and, and kurtosis. Um, and you're trying to, to fit them in your investment portfolio and you're subject to a, to a budget. So this is non-linear, non-convex, uh, et cetera. But in DP, it has a knapsack uh, structure, so you, you can optimize over that. And we did two things. We optimized over that problem. And for fun, we took the, um, the floor of that function to make the objective uh, function not continuous. And so this might seem crazy, but there is application in retail industry, for example, where you can predict the number of sales, like you can predict the, the sales of a store as a function of the number of employees. And we get this prediction with you know, machine learning, which is a black box. And so these predictions are given for two employees, three employees, four employees, and they're not continuous. So we do see these problems in practice. Um, and we look at this, uh, first of all, for the smaller problems, nonlinear solvers. So here, Nitro and Adopt are doing really bad because the problem is as too much local minimum. And uh, our complete approach are basically you know, able to explore the search space completely and prove optimality. Um, but when the problem becomes larger, this kind of puzzle effect smooths out, and nonlinear solvers are doing. Uh, better, although uh, I think uh, nobody's proving optimality at that point. The uh, the Albert algorithms are 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 not very far here. Like for example, this one is is not very far from the best one. Um, but however, when we use discrete coefficient, then uh, adopt doesn't work because it cannot differentiate the uh, objective function anymore. And uh, Nitro is performing well, but the Albert algorithm it has a bit of edge, although they are still quite uh, quite similar. So I'll finish with this. I think dynamic programming is a, is a beautiful bridge between reinforcement learning and constraint programming. It allows for automatic model building and RL environment building. Uh, and it provides a way that we hope we can, we can pursue working on this. We have no promising results on, on some toy problems, but that are still very combinatorial. Um, the, the code of what I've just mentioned is out there. But we have also a version that will come out uh, probably in a week or two. We're just cleaning out everything, which will be uh, fully integrated and in Julia. So the name is CPRL, it comes from CPRL. Um, so the paper is up, up there on archive already, and uh, the source code will be uh, on GitHub, uh, let's say, uh, hopefully within less than a month. And uh, I think the challenge not lies in testing with larger problems, more difficult constraints. And what we so far, we only input constraints that can go in the DP. But in theory, we could also deal with constraints that go, don't go in the DP. And I think at least my personal objective on the go is, is, is to go towards a general purpose, let's say, constrained dynamic programming solver, where you could state problems that have an infinite, or let's say, very highly exponential state space, but you could solve them as we solve MIPS, basically, that are defined over exponential search space. So with this, I'll conclude here. These are the two papers, um, and the GitHub of content contains all the all the necessary material. Thank you for your time.